Excellent. He'll start it off with some uh, 10 minute or 15 minute uh, introduction to ADS CFT in the context of a 1D uh, theory, 1 plus 1D theory. And then we'll take it from there. So this will be just following Suki's uh, lecture on Mera. Thank you. It's, it's great to be back with you. I hope everybody is enjoying the workshop. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit more today about um, some aspects of doing DMRG with matrix product states. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and show you my outline here on the next slide. And um, um, so I'll tell you a bit more about doing DMRG with matrix product states, but it's specifically about the kind of Hamiltonians that are most natural to use in this kind of DMRG. And then I'll tell you for about the rest of the time, about half the talk, about a, a method called METS, which is an acronym for these minimally entangled typical thermal states, and I'll explain more about that. It's a method for doing um, DMRG at finite temperature. Uh, but also, um, one reason I wanted to talk about it is that um, I believe this method should be fairly easy to extend to other kinds of tensor networks beyond one dimension. So it might be of interest to many of you who are looking at like 2D, 2D tensor networks. Um, but then I, I wanted to start off today by answering some questions or attempting to answer some questions that came up yesterday and also by email. So that's what the next few slides uh, are about. So um, one question that came up, um, and I wish I could spend even more time on this, but unfortunately it's still it's, it'll probably be a bit fast for some of you, um, but is what is this uh, meaning of, ex of uh, projecting the Hamiltonian into the local basis? So remember that you have a matrix product state, and you um, try to make almost all of the tensors um, out of unitary um, matrices. And so the, I only show those matrices here. And um, when you have these unitary tensors, you can think of them as um, forming a basis for a piece of the system. And if these tensors are um, made um, with the SVD, if you don't truncate, it's actually a perfect um, transformation from one basis, the lattice basis, to some other effective basis. Uh, if you do truncate, then it's um, not an exact mapping. It's like a partial mapping. It's like an isometry. So um, you actually leave out some of the states in the basis. But the idea is that when you're looking for the one state. But um, just in terms of pictures, when we say local basis, that, what we mean is what these arrows are indicating here, which is these um, states that are labeled by these labels that are local to a particular site, or maybe a set of sites. So here I'm focusing on site 3, and the local basis would be the, the actual basis of site 3, and um, a label that labels the rest of the system going away from site 3. And those, those states, labeled alpha here in this figure, um, are uh, a set of states that, um, if, again, if you, don't, if you don't truncate, then in this case, if, say, say for the case of spin a half, the alphas would run from 1 to 4. And that would, let, that would be some combination of all the original states of the lattice. If you do truncate, then um, the alpha would run from 1 to some smaller value. And that, that value is actually the M in DMRG, this, this number M, which is the number of states kept for the left half of the system. So that's, that's what we mean. And um, I thought it would be helpful on the next slide to show you in kind of gory detail what this actually looks like. And hopefully this will also motivate you to be more interested in um, using tensor networks to do your calculations. Um, so this is just an example of for three sites, if we go ahead and contract these two unitaries together, we get some kind of unitary uh, map that maps both of the first two spins into this alpha labeling. And um, so then we can see below what this looks like. So the idea is this tensor labeled H is the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian in the lattice basis. That's this gray tensor with the three indices on the top and bottom. And um, the labels are S1, S2, S3, and on the top, S1 through S3 primed. And then the U's act on S1 and S2 and then group those indices S1, S2 and map them to these states labeled by alpha. So you see that the result down in the lower right-hand corner is um, this tensor H tilde, which has these new labels alpha and alpha prime, as well as the original S3, S3 prime labels. So, um, and again, you can see by the way the indices are grouped on the U's that um, it's like a matrix if you group the S1 and S2 together. Then, then it has the properties of a unitary matrix or an isometry if you include truncation. So hopefully that clears some of that up. Um, also, just this morning I received an, a nice email from Himadri Barman, um, who I'd actually met before um, a couple of years ago in Mahabreshwar. And um, so, hi Himadri. Um, and he asked me some nice questions, so I wanted to share these questions with everybody and attempt to answer them. Um, some of them are a bit outside of my expertise, but I thought I would give it my best shot. Um, the first one is, why does this numerical renormalization group method that Ken Wilson first used, um, why does it succeed for the condo problem if it has this issue about um, 
treating boundary conditions too crudely. So it's, it does have that issue. Um, and so this, this slide is supposed to show you why it succeeds. And um, oh, sorry, I forgot to, um, most of the talk, I was pretty careful about not putting things in the corner. But um, some of it is covered up. <laughs> but so the idea is that, um, if, that um, Wilson began his study by first mapping the, um, I believe it was like a two, 2D or 3D condo problem to just a 1D chain, so it's an effective model for the condo problem. And at the left end of the chain, there's this impurity site. And then the way the way the model the way the mapping worked is that it gave something like a hopping model, except it's not a normal hopping model. It has these um, hopping strengths that decay exponentially quickly as you go away from the impurity site. And so, um, and this is discussed by the way in more detail in this uh, nice um, PRL paper um, published this year, which connects this original method of Wilson to a matrix product state version of the same method. So it's, it might be a nice um, read for those of you interested, but. Um, now, if, if uh, you please click on the slide, it shows um, how you can group the um, sites together in the NRG. And so in the NRG, the other day I showed it kind of uh, blocking many sites all at once. But the way it was really done was that you first group the first two, find its energy eigenstates, then the next two. And you see that each time, the coupling that's coupling those um, sites to the rest of the system over to the right is relatively weak, down by a factor of lambda or, um, yeah, down by a factor of like one over lambda compared to the energy scales of the sites that are grouped. So even though you're neglecting that bond temporarily, it's not so bad compared to the overall energy scale. So this is just a special model that where um, somehow your real space position is, is also connected to your energy scale that you're considering. So that's basically, in a nutshell, the reason why this NRG method um, does succeed for this kind of chain. Um, so then a related question was, um, just as in the NR NRG with the condo problem, can you use DMRG to produce RG flow diagrams? So can you study the flow of a Hamiltonian under DMRG, or you know, kind of ask questions about flowing toward critical points or, or you know, fixed points of RG, that kind of thing? Um, so this is a really interesting question, and my short answer is no, but I only mean no in the sense that it's not usually done. But um, uh, you know, and, and we know one case where it sort of could be done, which is this condo problem, which motivated the question, I believe. Um, there, you have, um, so DMRG is a really a real space RG method, and um, in the condo problem, at least in this mapping, real space is tied to energy in the sense that I just showed, where you have energy scales corresponding to positions of your lattice. Um, but that's not usually the case. Normally, real s energy um, separations are not really visible in real space. Um, I might so I can interrupt before you proceed. Yeah. In the standard uh, RG, uh, we talk about renormalization of coupling constants. Right. So, Berman's question maybe is related. Are there coupling constants here which renormalize and are there flow for that? Okay, please proceed. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, um, right. So, basically, again, I don't, I don't think, I think the answer is, is no on the, on the face of it um, in the sense that normally you don't have that sort of picture in DMRG. Uh, but um, I think it's an interesting possible area of future research, and I think that DMRG could be um, sort of a path toward coming up with such a method. Um, so on the next couple of slides, I showed one way you approach this question. Um, so the idea is that um, this may be known to some of you, and uh, have already been mentioned in, in a talk, or maybe the one later today. Um, so please, uh, next slide. Um, so the idea is that um, you can think of a matrix product state that has this kind of gauge um, transfer this um, particular gauge where most of the um, tensors are unitaries as actually a kind of real space RG where um, first you think of applying U1 and that, um, that sort of takes the basis for site 1 and transforms it into some kind of a renormalized basis. Then you apply U2, then you apply U3. Each time you're um, grouping more sites together into some kind of renormalized um, basis. And, and um, finally at the end you have your wave function there at the top which is site 4. Um, and then on the next slide, I show how in a different gauge, you can picture the RG scheme differently. So now you're grouping the left two sites um, together and the right site, the rightmost site four to get um, as, a, as another um, effective basis. So I'm not the biggest expert on this picture, but it's sort of, the idea is it should be reminiscent of a mirror. Um, it's, it's saying that, uh, that um, matrix product states are kind of like to gap systems as a mirror is to a critical system, it, only in a very loose sense. Um, but the idea is that by taking this picture and developing it more, I think you actually could develop a real, more honest RG um, method. And the idea is that you would then take these unitaries and apply them to your Hamiltonian. And then if you study the resulting Hamiltonian, it might have 
it might have the same form as your original Hamiltonian, but with different coupling constants. To get to get back to the to the question, um, and so uh, and I should mention also that um, we're, we're doing something already like this in a, in a current paper that that's on the archive, which is that we um, have mapped uh, these one fermion models that we're looking at with long range interactions this way, and we can actually extract renormalized couplings that way. But it's not really DMRG; it's some kind of modified type of DMRG. Um, and so then the final question, which I think is, is very relevant for yesterday's talk, is um, sort of getting to the question of why do we really need um, MPS-based DMRG? Um, and so more specifically, um, does it really really a different method from the traditional DMRG, and does it make a accurate calculations um, lead to more efficiency, and also actually get kind of qualitatively new results that you could some other way? Um, so. Basically, um, this is a kind of a subtle question, and, and someone, other people might disagree with my answer. I'm sorry, but basically, I would say the short answer is that for the ground state, that, that really traditional, if you just do DMRG for the ground state, either MPS language using the traditional DMRG, basically, not much. Um, you get the same answer, and the efficiency is, is basically the same. There might be mild difference. They are probably having more to do with the way you wrote the code more than the the MPS versus traditional. Um, and really, you can map almost every step of the traditional code to an MPS code. Um, you do get some, some actual important advantages when you consider excited states. And so um, this was pointed out by Sherlock in his recent article um, about matrix product state DMRG. So the next slide um, is um, one way that you could use matrix product states to create uh, excited states more efficiently. Um, so could you please click to the next slide? Um, so, and states, the idea is, uh, let's say you just use um, matrix product state DMRG to find the ground state of your So you run DMRG, some number of sweeps, and um, you find the ground state. And let's call that psi zero. Uh, it's cut off slightly, but um, we we'll call it psi zero. Then the idea is that um, you can now um, form a new Hamiltonian, call it H1, which is your original Hamiltonian, plus some weight W which you take to be, um, well, it depends. You have to sort of experiment with different weights. But just think of it as some number of order. And then you, um, you multiply this times this outer product of psi 0 with itself. And the idea is that now if you consider the Hamiltonian H1, psi 0 is no longer the ground state of this Hamiltonian because its energy is pushed up by this number of w. And so the, the, the real ground state of H1 will be the, the next excited state up, assuming that w is chosen properly. Um, and so but uh, you know the second term, mm -hmm. when you look in terms of uh, as local Hamiltonian, it may not be sums of local Hamiltonians. The second right. piece may have very long range part. Yes, absolutely. So this is not a, a traditional Hamiltonian that's local, but it's um, somehow this non-local piece that you, is, is very carefully, very specific I see. chosen um, here. So so any issues where, where you might worry about the ground state coming out being some kind of, some kind of long range correlations. That's, that we, if, if we do this method, and it works quite well, okay. actually. Oh, um, and so, actually, type of, you can kind of think of it as a canonical transformation of your age, mm -hmm. in a sense. And so, it's like, uh, I think so, uh, Professor Amshesha has a comment. Uh, please. Yes. And all that you are doing is resetting the Hamiltonian matrix that the uh, RDR had. So I'll uh, push the lower side on the value and energy source and get the second lower side value. Correct. Yeah. But that is not the one that is actually optimized or the JR. So density matrices are not constructed corresponding to psi 1, so it is not really accurate. Right. So <coughs> my question was see, all these approaches are well suited when you have uh, total Hamiltonian, which is a sum of local Hamiltonians. Once you add this extra fellow. No, but that is the same basis as that. I mean, the so. I see. So in the new basis, it may be very local. Yeah. OK. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sure. So, um, so I, didn't, I didn't hear the entire comment. Uh, is there a part I should respond to? OK. Uh, oh. So I, okay. Well, what, what I said was, uh, this is actually meant for obtaining the second lower value of the Hamiltonian. Uh, because it's, it's meant for obtaining the second Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We are obtaining the second lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian oh, yes. H, yes. and it is not optimized for the state psi one. That is the density matrices. Uh, if I if I, I were to look at it as a DMRG method, 
the density matrix is not constructed for the state psi 1 consistently. And so all that you are getting is the second lowest uh, eigenvalue of the matrix H by uh, a technique similar to deflation techniques. Similar to? Deflation. The deflate. matrix, you know, you... I see. To get the higher and higher eigenvalues, you can deflate it and get it or project out the first one. Okay multiple targeting method where you try to combine two states into one density matrix to make the basis. But this, this method on the previous slide is um, different from that. And so the idea is that you can get the um, first excited state very accurately. And uh, let me just say um, that the important fact on this slide is that you never actually form this, this sum, this H plus the W. Mm -hmm. You only imagine forming it. You never actually try to add the Hamiltonian to this outer product. I see. What you do is you just keep them separate and when you do the, the um, eigensolver step in the DMRG, at that point you, you act each piece on your wave function and then you add the result together. You don't ever add the Hamiltonians. Um, that's just an important comment for those interested. Okay. Um, so then the final, final part of this question that I wanted to mention is that um, the DMRG with matrix product states, I believe, has led to some very qualitatively new results that, are, um, that could be very important and some of them are already in use, and uh, this is just a short list of some um, of these results. So one of them that you may be familiar with is that um, Ian McCulloch, in a nice uh, article that's um, published at this archive uh, listing, um, showed how now the infinite density matrix, um, the infinite DMRG method, which was actually the original one, um, can be made um, to have a wave function acceleration scheme. And uh, the only way to really see this is to use matrix product states. And so this is a very nice uh, method. Um, and then also, this matrix product states have led to a lot of nice um, schemes for doing, um, for doing uh, real-time dynamics and finite temperature. Also, um, Steve and I are, have been working on a way to parallelize DMRG in real space, and so we're going to be publishing that soon. And that, that heavily uses matrix product states. And then also, you can combine DMRG with real space RG methods. So these are just some of the qualitative things you can get. OK, good. So, um, so now that today, the, getting into the talk, actually, um, I was going to tell you about matrix product operators, which are um, the Hamiltonians that you use when you're doing uh, matrix product state DMRG. So the reason you need to use these kind of Hamiltonians is because just as you need to work locally with your wave function, you also need to work locally with your Hamiltonian. So you can see that if you tried to uh, um, build this effective Hamiltonian and project it to a single site, if you use the entire Hamiltonian at once, there's too many indices. Um, basically, there's um, in, in, in site indices exposed. And so the contraction will scale exponentially in the size of the system if you try to do this contraction. So um, the solution is to um, work with a different form of H. Uh, so if you please go to the next slide. Um, so what you need is, is just as you try to work with a local form of your wave function, a matrix product state, you want to work with a local form of your Hamiltonian. Um, so the next slide shows, um, shows how this is an analogy with a matrix product state. Just as each piece of the matrix product state has a single side index, each piece of a matrix product operator has two site indices, so it's like a, it's like a matrix itself. It's like an operator. And so it's just um, called a matrix product operator by analogy with a matrix product state. Um, so then uh, let me show you some examples of kind of simple, like elementary matrix product operators. And then we can work up to the more general um, type, and I'll show you how to construct them. So this is the most simple one, which is it's almost too simple. Um, and it's the identity operator, min the minibody identity operator. And so each site um, just has one operator on it, which is factorized from all the others, and it's just the identity. Um, so what do I mean by these lines being the identity? Well, a single line in this notation is actually representing a two by two matrix for the case of spin a half, or you know, d by d for if you have your site dimensions d. So this line just means that um, if the two indices are the same, you get one. Um, and then if you click again, the, the two indices are different, you get zero. Um, so that's all the line means. It just means make the two indices at the end of the lines the same. Um, so now a, a less trivial example is to have a matrix product operator that represents an operator um, living on a single site. And so this operator on site two is just um, the matrix elements of some, some operator that you want to act on site two. Um, so if we take a specific example, we could pick this to be SX and then it would have these um, values. This tensor would have the values if, if you set 1 and 0 or 0 and 1, you get 1. Otherwise, you get 0. So that's, that's all these tensors are saying. Um, and then you can make um, even more interesting um, types of MPOs, which is to um, make a product of operators. So if you have a product of operators like this, um, 
So let me show you how you can combine them now to make um, an MPO. Um, so please, please advance. Um, so how do you actually make a Hamiltonian with these pieces? So one way that's actually um, kind of simple, but it's, it's quite important, is that you can actually um, sum these uh, pieces together. So if you have a Hamiltonian where you don't know how to make the MPO exactly, you can actually just take product of this type and just add them up. And that's um, a good tensor code will provide us a method for adding them up. So for instance, in the iTensor library, we have a, a method that will do this for you. And so you can um, just make the Hamiltonian. But, but actually, I wanted to spend most of the time talking about how you can actually construct these Hamiltonians. Um, so thinking of the case, uh, for instance, 1D Hamiltonians. But you can also do this for 2D Hamiltonians. Um, the basic idea is that you want to look internally at the structure of one of these matrix product operators. And uh, the thing we're going to exploit is that you can think of a matrix product operator as actually a Markov chain, um, which I don't have too much time to get into, but we'll see some of it. Um, and this, this is explained in a paper by Crosswhite Bacon, 2008. And so um, we'll see what this means in some examples in a minute. But the idea here is that we want to think of one of these rank four NPS, NPO tensors as actually a matrix of matrices, a matrix of operators. So rather than thinking of it as some generic rank four tensor for indices, we want to think of being first focusing on the left, the left and right indices, then thinking about the top and bottom. So on the, on the next slide, let me show you what I mean. So um, if we set, first we set, we think of set indices, first the left, set them both equal to one. Um, so that's shown on the next slide. Um, then um, what that does is it reselects the one one element of this matrix of, of operators. So then we think of holding those fixed, and what's left is the two remaining free indices. And they um, now will, if we look at their elements, they will have the elements of the identity operator. So um, the next slide shows um, what that means. So it means if we set those indices of one on the diagonal, and then the off diagonal elements are zero. So now another example from this same tensor, I um, set the row to two, um, so please uh, admit. Then um, if we set the row to two, and then the um, column to one, so that means to set the left and right indices, then this two one of this of matrices, and in indices we get a Z operator. So if we look at the diagonal of that remaining piece, it has the elements of the uh, SZ operator. That's what we mean by this notation. You think so setting the left and right, then you then you think of using the top and bottom. So with this intuition, you can actually build different Hamiltonians for 1D. So um, I'll show you a, a, an a example of this. Um, the example is the Ising chain. And the Ising chain um, just has um, products of SZ, SZ on neighboring sites. And so the convention is here is lower triangular convention, um, which is we only set four triangular of these um, matrix matrices of matrices to non-zero value. And we also use to mention that boundary conditions are such that we take the um, incoming uh, index on the far left to be set to three always, and the outgoing one on the far right to be set to one always. So now let's um, see what we get. The setting the left uh, most index to three means that we begin by only looking on the third row of the first tensor. And so on the third row, we get a sum of two pieces, and the first, the one and has this SZ operator. On site one, we get SZ. And then, um, then that means that as we leave that tensor, we leave on the second column, because you see the SZ is located in the second column. So that means on the next tensor, we go to the second row. And the only operator there is another SZ. And then that's on the first column. Finally, in the last tensor, we go to the first row, and we get the X. And so that's one of the terms in our Hamiltonian. Um, and so now on the next slide, we can see the other term, which is what if instead we take Term, which is to take on the third row. And again, we start in the third row because of that three on the left. Um, now that, uh, that operates the third column. So we go to, on the next tensor again to the third row. There we can pick up this SZ operator. That's on the second column, and then we go to the second row, and then, we're, um, and then we get a product of S is now on the two sites. So the two terms that we get are shown here. And so those are actually, if you, if you check more carefully, those are the only two terms that are non zero. Hamiltonian is just the sum of these two things, and that's the correct Hamiltonian for the Ising chain on the three sides. So now we can generalize more operators. So if you want to make the transverse field Ising, you put these um, field terms, because, because they're on site, see them, put them in this lower left corner. And the way this works now, uh, again, if we look at the, the terms we get, if we start on the third row, um, 
we can start getting this field term in the first tensor, um, if you please advance. And uh, we get the field term in the first tensor as one of our terms. It's on the first column, so we immediately get the first row in the next tensor. And then we stay always on the first row and first column thereafter because of the structure of the matrices. So we just get identities for all the other sites. And so there's another term. If we get the identity on the first site, that's in the third column. So we go to the third row on the second one. And then we leave on the first column and then to the first row and get an identity. So again, we get, and then of course, there's a third term that's not shown where we get the magnetic field on the last site. So that's how you can build complicated experience. And so I just wanted to leave a example is the, um, the MPO tensor for the Heisenberg. So this is where you'd have an SU2 invariant model. Um, and I'm not going to go through this example in detail, but I just want to show you how these, these could generalize. And so maybe as an exercise, you can go showing how this kind of matrix in it will give you the um, correct Heisenberg. You can see that it's really to the same case, but now just have additional operators. Just as we have a pair of SZs, we also have a pair S plus, S minus, another S minus, S plus. And you see the couplings are there in the bottom. Um, so that's that's all for that. Um, so the reason this is really useful for doing RG with matrix product states is that um, is that uh, it's got the local character that you need to be efficiently with your Hamiltonian. So the next slide shows that. Um, so the idea is that we want to do a direction of H where we wrap it in our um, unitaries or our, our alternatively you can say isometries if we're doing truncation. Um, and so we want to project a piece of our Hamiltonian into the local basis in the third site. And so um, the idea, first of all, we want to apply the answers one at a time. If you try to apply them all at once, then the scale of your algorithm will be You need to apply them one at a time to get the m cubed scaling that DMRG um, is supposed to have. So what you do is you apply the first unitary in contact, and then the, the tensors are going that way. Then you apply the second one in contract, and the tensors um, join. And keep going them time, and you see that what you're left with is an Hamiltonian where you've localized all the indices from the left over to site three. And so now all the indices, all the, um, labels labeling the left side of the system equal now to site three. And, and you repeat this to the right. You don't show it for the, for the right side, but basically it looks the same. I should note that this the left slide here, um, the indices, these are the um, projected pieces of your Hamiltonian. And these are what you actually store in memory as you sweep back and forth doing the uh, matrix products. Um, Miles, yes. uh, your uh, voice is, there is some interruption. Will you please try to put your microphone and uh, speak. Sure, I can I can switch to my head, headset. Yeah, my exactly, let's check that for a while. I do not know if it is due to that or due to internet. Okay, so now I'm using my headset. Hopefully that will um, help with the sound. Okay, let us check for five minutes. Yeah, please continue. Okay, great. So, so now switch to a different talk. So please, if there are any questions about matrix product operators, um, now would be the time. Any questions? Okay, please proceed. Okay, so now I'm going to remaining telling you about um, this uh, method for doing uh, finite temperature simulations with DMRG. And this method goes by the... Uh, the name METS. And by the way, just to connect with the previous part, um, matrix product operators are actually very useful for this method, especially if you work with it in 2D. Though um, today I'll just tell you about using a different way of doing, doing the method that doesn't use them, but just as a side comment. And so METS is an acronym that stands for Minimally Entangled Typical Thermal States. Um, and this was come up by Steve in uh, 2009. And uh, you can read about it in his, his Physical Review Letters article. But um, I'll tell you the details today. So um, just, just by way of introduction, this is a method for doing finite temperature simulations, and it's very efficient. It solves um, many of the, things that were, uh, the efficiency issues that were present in attempts to do um, finite temperature DMRG. And it works um, actually a sampling method, the type of Monte Carlo method, but one that does not have a sign problem. And um, it samples um, finite temperature states that we call typical thermal states. And uh, this method is described in detail in these two articles. Um, Low. And these slides will be posted, so you can, you can take down these citations later. Um, but before, before I go into detail about the algorithm, I thought it would be helpful just to show you the basic steps of the algorithm. And uh, so if anything seems confusing in the next few slides, please just wait, and I'll go through all this again in more detail. Um, but basically, just to give you a 
you, you start, and, um, and here we're spin, but it works for other kinds of models. And we're thinking like also of a 1D. Um, so you start products, and then you evolve this products every time. And all that means is that you apply the operator e to the minus beta h over 2. And the is basically because this is a wave function. So that's like a square root of the density matrix. Um, so you apply this operator. And I'll say more about how to do that. Um, and then the next step is that once you've applied the operator, you now have some kind of entangled many-body state. And this state comes from a product state is called a METS. And I'll tell you also why it's called that. Um, and once you have one of these METS, you can do interesting things with it. Um, the most common thing is that you can just measure its properties. So for instance, you can compute an expectation value of an operator, say, A, uh, here on the third site. And then you can just test some number. And you can just store that number and keep it for later. And at the end of the algorithm, when you're done, if you average all those numbers, you get the correct thermal average as if you had um, calculated the entire density matrix. And so once you're, done, once you're done measuring all the quantities you want to measure on this state, you now have to get enough product state to um, apply imaginary time evolution to. So to do that, you have to, and you have to get it with the correct probability. So to do that, you have to use the wave function, just as in the sense of you know, quantum mechanics, you collapse the wave function. And uh, so I think that works. But this, the next few slides just show a couple of that. You go site by site, just each time collapsing uh, site into a product state and factorizing it over the rest of the wave function. And so then you obtain a different product state <laughs> down to some finite temperature. So let's see what works um, in detail now. So first, oh, so unfortunately that's cut off, but you, you all know the Boltzmann distribution. So um, <laughs> first, uh, just a slide for a brief review of what, what, um, finite temperature physics. So the idea is we want to work in the canonical ensemble, which in the case of energy eigenstates, um, is a set of states with these weights that are nothing but the Boltzmann weights. And that's just e to the minus beta times the energy normalized by the partition function z. And then once you have these energy eigenstates, you do a sum over them with, this, with these weights, and you get the correct normal average. Um, and of course, in in terms of the density matrix, where um, instead of having these C number weights, you just have an operator of the weights. But the advantage there is it lets you compute this trace over the, the thermal density matrix. You can think of computing that trace in any basis, not just in the basis of energy eigenstates. Um, and by the way, this is an actual car that was parked in the um, parking lot of the UC Irvine um, campus, so I thought it was funny. Uh, <laughs> it's the K-Log license plate. So, um, so now let's, um, let's, let's say, um, Let's say we did have a way to actually work with energy eigenstates. The next slide says, um, let's, let's imagine we had some kind of um, magical way to generate the energy eigenstates. I say magical because they're very hard to calculate in practice. Um, and you could somehow generate time, and, and you'd be guaranteed that the relative probability of getting the, um, the, the, getting the next energy is e to the minus beta times its energy. And so if you see the set that I showed, there's actually some re repetition that we got twice, and we also got the second excited state twice. So it's like a Markov chain walk, random walk, in the space of energy eigenstates. Once you do this random walk, if you long enough, if you take now these states which have come in, and just do an un-expectation value um, average over these, um, these states, you get the correct thermal average, because the states are already distributed with the correct probabilities in your random walk. Um, so this is just the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo. But the problem is, um, and the slide discusses this, uh, the energy eigenstates are practical um, basis to use from Monte Carlo. Um, so please advance to the next. Um, how is the uh -huh. <clears throat> Sorry, we are, there is some interruption. Okay. Um, would it just help if I try to talk? I think the, uh, uh, please continue. Sure. Um, so hopefully the sound will improve. Um, yes. So I'm saying it's not practical eigenstates as the basis for this method sampling because, the, um, of course, it's very hard to find the energy eigenstates. If you could actually find them, then you would and you wouldn't need another method. Um, so we don't have a method like that. What we um, have is other, another basis we could sample in, and that's what I'll be telling you about in the few slides. But this, the idea we need to find some other ensemble to use. And actually, there's many, many different ensembles you can use, energy state, the energy eigenstate ensemble. And uh, the, uh, the sufficient or necessary condition is that this ensemble set of states phi n, and let me point out these states can repeat. 
the fines could it actually all be the same or they could be different. I'm sorry if you go back one. Um, then it's clear to with relative probability rates Pn that if you add up in this, if they add back up to the density um, at, beta, at temperature beta, then, um, and that mention beta is 1 over T, if, if those of you aren't familiar, um, then, um, then you take a, if you take an average in that, in that ensemble, you get the correct thermal average. So there's a general recipe for any thermal, thermal ensemble just for every basis. So let's say take any thermal basis um, labeled here by the states I, and uh, they can, it can really be any, any basis you like. Uh, it's a, a thermal ensemble from this basis, density matrix, at temperature beta, and then cut it in half, just meaning square root times a square root. That's an exact thing you can do. And then you insert a resolution identity between, which just means a sum of the outer of I with I. Um, and the, way, the reason you wanted to do this is to keep making everything look symmetric. So now um, the idea is that this product um, uh, please continue. Um, this product, you can phi tilde sub i. So if you think of acting e to the minus beta h over 2 onto the state i, then that product, let's call it phi tilde sub i. And um, we've basically made one of the thermal ensembles. And uh, but the thing is, you normalize the states. The states don't have to be um, orthogonal to each other, but they do have to be normalized. And um, normalizing actually gives you what these weights p i are. So um, at the end, the idea is that you normalize states phi e to the minus beta h over 2 to, some, to your basis states i. You normalize them. And then you, once you normalize them, that gives you p i. And it's easy to show that if you sum up the outer products of the phi i weighted with the p i, it recovers that for you the density matrix. So you've made one of these ensembles. And so the idea is now you want to sample the phi i with the probability, relative probability i. So you want to take a random walk in the space of the phi i's. And if you take expectation value, you're guaranteed to the right thermal average. Um, but this is which basis i should we use to seed our, um, so we have to start from some to apply um, this time evolution to. And so there's basically, I'll give you on this slide and on the next slide, I'll give you two arguments that will lead us to the um, that we want to use. So um, <coughs> what is thinking about entanglement? And so the idea is that in G methods, in, in the matrix product state methods, the difficulty of working with state um, is um, growing with its entanglement. The more entanglement, then the more states you have to keep and the larger matrices you have to work with. So to have the least entanglement that we can get away with. Um, and so I, and it already, already has some entanglement, applying e to the minus beta h over to it only increases the entanglement in general. So we want to choose these states i to have as little entanglement as possible. That the, the entanglement, when it does increase, it will increase to some lower value. Um, and then the next intuition is a typical one, which is that think of taking our recipe for making this thermal ensemble and taking it all the way back to t goes to t, that's the same as saying beta equals 0. So that means that we actually don't do the imaginary time evolution at all. And so actually our thermal ensemble is nothing but the states i. And so intuitively, at um, infinite temperature, we know that physics is totally classical at infinite temperature. And so, um, and so the idea is we want to take these states to have some kind of classical properties. So we know that product states are actually that state. They have classical properties as much as we can make them. Um, so the next slide says that's the to make. We want to choose this base to be the set of classical product states. And um, now, you know, of course, that's not a um, can choose classical product states fit for a spin system in the Z basis or in the X basis. But some basis, let's say the Z basis, have the two properties we want. They're both classical, so physical, and they have zero entanglement. And so all we mean is states that are factorized in every site. And so this leads us to the ensemble that we want to use, which is that's and that's where we use the recipe that I outlined, but we apply it to classical product state at, at infinite temperature. And so we, we make this product h over 2 onto i, and then we normalize it, and we get phi i. And that state is called a state phi i. Um, so the entanglement of 0, the idea is that the entanglement of met i will not be 0 anymore. But, but we hope that it will be minimally entangled in some sense. It won't be entangled if we had made some other choice for i. Um, and that actually does less be the case. Um, also, we, you can find working with these METs, 
that they have nice um, properties that are intuitively correct for your system. So let's imagine a system of spin that has some kind of um, phase transition at temperature where you have spontaneous symmetry because themselves break symmetries of the Hamiltonian. As you um, apply um, time evolution and go to lower and lower temperatures, once you phase transition, you'll actually see that the mass will break symmetries themselves. And so they have kind of intuitively physical properties that you would want. And so for this reason, that's why the background is there that calls them entangled typical thermal states. So that's, that's the meaning behind it. So uh, please proceed. And so details of how do you actually these um, on the computer, how do you actually calculate nets and work? Um, and let me see how I'm doing on time. Um, okay, good. So Hamiltonians, you can take advantage of the Trotter decomposition. And so here I'm showing a higher order Trotter decomposition. But the idea is that we want to apply a, an accurate time over two, but we can break that up uh, as just steps um, tau, and then we can make an approximation, which is say, what if our Hamiltonian is actually a sum of terms? So the h1, h2 here, are, we imagine there's an h3 all the way up to h n minus one, but terms, and so our Hamiltonian is actually just a sum of neighbor bonds. Um, we can do the Trotter position, break our Hamiltonian into these gate operators. So that's shown on this, and so now we can take these gate operators. And so if we take a small enough, then a good approximation. And we can apply them one at a time to our, to our um, matrix part state. So we, say we apply them on the first bond. And after we're done, we, we have to SVD the matrix product state. And in the SVD, we add to the rest. And that way, we've moved our um, amplitudes over to the next site. And now we're, it's appropriate to apply the second bond. And we can do that again exactly. And what we do, the approximation consists of, in the SVD, you always truncate because you, um, you don't want the number of states in your matrix product state to grow indefinitely. You have to keep some limit on the number of states used. But still, you can, for, for a moderate number of states, you can basically... Exactly. So, um, so now, at the end of the time evolution, in anybody states, which is called a METS. And it's really interesting because not only can you, say, calculate the energy of the METS or calculate the magnitude on a given site and get these numbers, you can actually calculate Lots of detailed properties at every site. And um, so here I'm showing an example of um, this is the S equals 1 Heisenberg chain on 100 sites and only showing sites 20 through 80 in the bulk. The picture here is taken to be theta of 10, which is basically pretty low, pretty ground state physics, but you're not all the way to the ground state. And um, so here we show, first of all, I'd like you to focus on the um, green, red, and black curves. You see that they're very um, zigzaggy in the plot. And those are local magnification on each site. And see that they have very rapid um, oscillations. And that's the um, male um, correlations that are present in this model. It's an anti-ferromagnetic nearest neighbor model. But then you see that these correlations have kind of characteristic um, correlation length. So for instance, in the middle plot, you see that there's a region where the correlation, where the um, spins are predominantly um, fluctuating in the direction. And the SX and SY um, components are small. But then as you go away from that region over about a scale of maybe 20 lattice or so, you see that there's a twist in the order or, or in the uh, magnetization, and you get predominantly fluctuations along the SY direction. You see that the energy fluctuates, and where the energy is low, the system looks like the ground state. Well, I'm sorry, it's still on the previous. Um, so when the energy is low, close to the ground state, which we know is a spin liquid for this model, so the magnetization is also small. Those regions, the entropy shown in the upper left is also relatively high. So it's kind of neat to see the properties on um, finite nature in detail like this. Um, so now, excuse me, um, mm -hmm. compared to the gap in this model, how small is the temperature? Um, yes, good is question. So, um, right, I should have written that. Um, I think the gap is wrong, but I think the gap is uh, of order one. So I think you are, well, OK, I probably, I probably shouldn't speculate. I, I didn't check okay. the numbers. I was wondering but whether it's nearly ground state or, OK, fine. Uh, I, I know one way I can answer that, which is if you look at the bond energy plot, um, the, that number negative one, one is quite close to the ground state. So you can see locally how the um, energy looks mm -hmm. relative to that you're within 
um, a very tiny um, percentage of the ground state energy. So I believe this is already quite close to the ground state. Ground state, okay. That's what Ramshes is saying that the ground state, the bond energy is 0.4. Uh, gap is 0.4, okay. Yeah, good. Minus. Okay, please proceed, yeah. So you were low temperature. So temperature low compared to the gap. That's right. So this is a pretty low temperature compared okay. to the gap. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So thank you. Uh, so now this is to the last step of the algorithm. Um, so we've already obtained one, one met. So we chose some kind of arbitrary state, and we push it down in temperature. So now the, um, the last step of the algorithm is to collect the function. And I wanted to go through this in detail. So this is a cartoon show, you know, if you have any state, uh, there's lots of... Uh, Miles, uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, since there is some break, we will uh, test another method. Just wait for one minute. Please hold on. Uh, please begin. Um, please, yeah. Sure. So, um, so this this one is the final step of that algorithm is the momentum, and those are just so you detail. Um, so this is showing how you collapse the wave function. So, um, the idea is that a met is actually an entangled state, entangled many body state, and these these uh, pictures are just trying to put that in a form that you have some kind of spin um, so the idea is we want to remove all those spin fluctuations and obtain a product state where there's no fluctuations and everything is site factorized. So the way the algorithm works is actually you, the algorithm works inductively. You just go one site at a time. And so it's easy to start on the first site because you have an edge. So, so sorry, could you please go back one slide? Um, so on this side, it's just showing that, um, that you measure the probability. So, so here I'm considering the case of spin a half, just for simplicity, but it, it generalizes to any type of degree of freedom. So you measure these projectors. So here, one of them is, is the projector onto the state, which is just the outer product of the spin up state. And the other is the product of the spin down state. Take the expectation value of these projectors um, on site one, and those are probabilities that you can now um, use. And then the idea is you flip the coin. Um, so if you click on the side, it will flip the coin. And um, and so it, it, you choose with this point, weights come from those probabilities that you measure, you choose um, random which state that you're going to project into. So we so, uh, preferred a dollar. Oh, <laughs> is that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's off of the web. I thought it might be fun to use a rupee coin, but I hope. <laughs> so, so if you it will um, go to the, it'll flip the coin. And uh, so the idea is that we randomly flip the coin and we get um, the up state. But we could have gotten the down state. We use a weighted coin and the weights are coming from these probabilities that we already met, calculate. So finally, um, sorry, I made some So finally, this is the last step. We decided on a state to project into. Um, the last step number three is that you take this projection operator, which is that same outer product operator, to the site one. Now we're forcing the system to be in the up state. So you apply this projection, and uh, once you apply it, the system will factorize. And so now the um, the final side of this is showing that you um, now have the system up state on site one, and now it's it's disentangled from the, rest of the wave function as a result. And you have to normalize this state before proceeding. But once you normalize it, now you see that the rest of the chain is disentangled from the first side site. So you can just iteratively um, repeat this procedure. So, when you apply this procedure to every one at a time, the result is a new class product state. I call it I prime, and um, I don't show the proof here, but you can check that the probability of getting some particular I primed from the state phi I is given by this overlap. I primed overlap with phi, and the square of that overlap. So that number is the probability that you'll get a particular product state I prime. Um, and it's pretty easy to show by just going through the algorithm one by one. The it's this probability, this transition probability, P goes from I to I prime, where I 
major Mets out of, and I prime is the next class. That um, obeys this Markov chain um, con um, fixed point condition. So you can show um, it's basically a one-line calculation to show that if you um, that the, the PI, the probabilities of our of our Mets point of this kind of update. So this um, by by these collapses guarantees that you get the correct thermal distribution of these Mets, and that's an important fact. So now on the next slide, let me summarize um, the three steps of this algorithm, just just to kind of bring it all together. So the, uh, again, the algorithm is you start from a product state labeled I, and then you generate a, an unnormalized Metz phi tilt by applying this e to the minus beta h over 2 to it. Um, then you normalize the state. Once you normalize it, you have this state, and you can measure any observable you like, including the energy or uh, magnetization or anything, any local observable you can measure. And you save those numbers. Um, and then you are averaging those numbers at the end to get the thermal average. And then when you're done with that METS, you have to collapse it by that method I just showed. And that gives you a new product state automatically with this probability I prime overlap with phi I squared. And so that, that's guaranteed to give you the next METS with the correct probability. Um, good. So, um, so, so, question. So, the, you keep repeating this for the same beta. Right. And then once you convert, you go to another beta. That's right, exactly. So you stay at the same same data, and then you um, you measure all the observables. And when you're done, you um, so I should make a few comments along these lines, actually. So so you save all these numbers, and when you're done, uh, believe that you you reach convergence, which is something you can actually measure in the standard way by looking at autocorrelation effects and things. Um, you can um, average all those numbers with an unweighted average, and that will the correct thermal average that temperature beta, um, and uh, it's helpful different examples. Um, for instance, if you work at infinite temperature, that basically means you skip step one, because beta is zero. Mm -hmm. And so you're taking um, an average over many, many classical problems, and every time computing the, um, the, um, the me you're taking measurements in this basis of classical product states. So that temperature looks. And even though those states, they're very cheap to, to make, so it goes it works in there. Um, and if you go to the other extreme, which is beta to be very large, then every single METS will be the ground state. And I mean, I'm assuming there's a unique ground state, say. If that's the case, then every single METS will actually just be the ground state. You only need to do this once for that, that very large beta. So you do it once, and you find the ground state, and then you measure the observable, and then you're done, basically. You could do it again at that temperature, but you would just get the same number over and over again. Um, so of course, you want to use DMRG, and that's a nice complementary method to this METS, and you can check the um, numbers match up as you go to low temperatures. So that's just a bit of a comment about how you'd use it in practice. Okay. Uh, so good. I just wanted to, I mean, I remember in other numerical methods, you keep playing this exponential Hamiltonian operator to reach the ground state. So now we were making use of things that comes on the way. That's right. In uh, finding thermal properties. Okay. Just a loose comment here. You're doing this projector uh, method, but you're doing it very carefully. Okay. Um, Systematically and so on. Divided by two factor is very important, of that, course. And yeah, so you exactly. I don't understand the meaning of two. I will think about it. That you, but if you that will be one of the questions, I'm sure. Our, sure we right now, we have a question from uh, Kalyan. Uh, yes. Is it compared to Monte Carlo method of doing the thermal calculations? Uh, Miles, the question is how good it is compared to Monte Carlo methods of doing thermal physics for quantum systems? Um, I would say for 1D systems, it would probably be um, you know, extremely uh, competitive. Mm. Um, and would be especially nice because you get, for instance, I believe, um, first of all, you don't have to come up with any special um, estimators for measurement of observables like in Monte Carlo, because every time you're getting a matrix product state, and, and there you can measure everything you want to measure, including things like entanglement. So you could you could ask some very interesting questions about um, the average entanglement of the Metz ensemble, is um, you know other types of measures of finite temperature entanglement. So I feel like that's a very interesting future research project. Um, for 2D, this method you really want to use this method for 2D um, in a problem where you in a system where you don't have a time problem because there quantum Monte Carlo probably beat it pretty well. But the th the idea is that this gives do a very efficient simulations of 2D methods where you do have a sign problem. And there, um, this is really one of the only few methods that, that can do controlled simulations. 
Uh, one question. Uh, you made the statement that uh, when beta is large, basically one operation, if you start with a good enough state i, will take you to the uh, typical low temperature state. Yes. Have you looked at that wave function and seen how close it is to the actual ground states, for example? Um, yes, we have. Um, and, uh, well, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me to say at what that... Um, but that's amazing because you start it, with the product... But certainly we've seen that if you take beta large enough, you always reach the ground state, and that's... That, I see, that's interesting that, because you start with some product state, and then one operation rotates you into the ground, nearly ground state. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the product state is in... You know, there are certain cases where if the state is chosen um, to be in the wrong quantum number sector, you do okay. the evolution, mm -hmm. preserves quantum numbers, then you can end up in a different Sure, state. sure. Like if you started the ferromagnetic state. Yes, that's right. Okay. And so if evolution was pre always trying to preserve quantum numbers, mm -hmm. then it could go... You have to... Pretty close. So as long as you're of things, then you're, you're good. Yes. Um, Thank you. Right. Please. Sure. Mm, good. Um, and so... To answer that question about beta over two, we can go back later if we. But um, these uh, these slides, uh, final slides show, here are showing some inter very interesting properties of this algorithm. Um, so let me just uh, mention, and maybe do some more questions. So the um, I really like this algorithm. I feel like it has a lot more potential um, to be really made much more powerful, and also to be used to learn some very interesting things about physics. So one of the ways to use it in a much more powerful way. Um, is this, this algorithm is what's known as embarrassingly parallel. And that's actually a technical term in computer science, this embarrassingly parallel term. And so what that means is that um, this algorithm can be made parallel in a completely trivial way. And so what, what, the way you do this is that, um, let's say you take some initial state and make your first MET state, which is I call phi 1. Now you can do the collapse multiple times using a different random number generator or just, you know, read a random number generator. And you get different product states um, called A, 2B, and 2C. So now you can distribute those product states to three different computers, and on those three computers, you can now do the next step in parallel. And then you could keep doing this. You could always, and then from there on, these computers don't have to communicate whatsoever. So you could just keep generating state completely independently on those computers and just follow the numbers that you're measuring. And at the end, you just average all the numbers across the three computers with the correct thermal average. So this works parallel speed up of this. So that's very really nice if you have a lot of... ...in fact about this um, method. So I'm um, please... And so um, the, the collapse... Uh, one, one, my favorite part of this method is actually the um, collapse part because it's very interesting to think about. Um, there's some other things I didn't go into, but the one, one nice thing is that you can do the collapse in different... So if you started your um, algorithm working, say, in the SZ basis, you could perform the collapse in the SF basis. And that would really help your algorithm by giving it a shorter autocorrelation time. But um, it's interesting to think if you took a single uh, mini state and just collapsed it, again, um, then you'll get a different state every time. But those product states you get will have no correlation with each other whatsoever. And um, this is shown recently in detail by a nice preprint by um, Andy Ferris and Guy Vidal. I should have put Ferris's name also in this, uh, this uh, reference, so sorry about that. Um, and uh, they showed that this is actually a useful method for working with Mira. So if you do this kind of collapse, you can do this to sample the properties of a ground state Mira. She has this, um, it's a type of perfect sample where you're, where you're making perfect draws of pop states from a tangled many body state. So it's a really nice uh, thing to do. And then um, a final um, feature of this algorithm is that it's very general. So if you, I, I, I explained the only part where I was actually working in 1D was um, when I was talking about um, doing the imaginary time evolution and maybe a little bit about the um, collapse. But in general, you should be... Um, we all, many of the ways people optimize PEPs, for instance, era, is by using imaginary time evolution. And also this collapse algorithm to generalize to a, net, a tensor network as long as it's a unitary type tensor network. So um, this method should generate 2D um, types of tensor networks fairly readily, and that's an interesting direction for somebody to explore. Um, and also I wanted to show you some, some data and results in this method on the spin-1 chain. 
So not only can you make these nice pictures like I showed earlier, but you can get some serious data with this method. Um, so what we did is each point, we go to some temperature and um, work there, and then we loop over and over again until we get good convergence. Um, it shows the, um, mag the magnetic susceptibility on the top side and then the um, specific heat on the bottom side. And um, with this, this method has very high efficiency. At the bottom of the slide, I, um, I write the efficiency, the scaling of this method is like n, which is the size of your system, times m cubed, which is the um, familiar number of states cubed, as in DMRG, times beta, which is the inverse temperature. And so you see that the scaling is formally exactly the same as DMRG, as the finite DMRG, with this additional factor of beta. And so you have to work harder to go to lower temperatures, but of course, um, to go all the way to zero temperature, you shouldn't use this method. You can just use DMRG. So it's actually a really nice complementary method where you can, um, you know, get, get very good at, at higher temperatures. Where so let me say that the n is smaller at higher temperatures. So um, it's a very nice method that way, very efficient. Um, so now I wanted to, um, oh, and I should point out also that here in these, um, we were able to reach temperatures that are quite low, a beta of 50, where the gap is um, actually. Um, of order one, just about like a half. And so, um, see that, that you can see in the pictures, you can see the effects of the gap, that you get this kind of exponential decay of the specific lowest temperatures. Um, okay, good. So now on the, um, I wanted to actually show some movies that bring these, these METs, different movies. Um, and Steve made these movies, and they're very nice um, uh, ray tracing movies showing um, different METs for different systems. So hopefully we can uh, now put those movies up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Great. It looks good. So, show sequences that are generated for the um, square lattice Heisenberg model in 2D. And so, um, you see the nail parent, all the spins are um, anti aligned with their neighbor, but there's significant um, thermal fluctuations. And uh, this is beta 1, beta here is 10. Um, and also, the blue box are showing the expectation value of S dot S. So, you can see that this is already quite low, that the, um, that the uh, S dot S value. Okay, good. So, so I have a question. Uh, in the movie, the, you see spins which are moving. Mm -hmm. uh, are they the intermediate factored states? Oh, um, good question. So, um, so um, those are actually the spin. So there are actually all those measurements themselves. So the, here the idea is that the temperature is not yet so low. That the um, that the magnetization has really started going to zero. So those spins are the values that you have actually measured. That's right. Um, the, so scale in that movie, so they could actually be small, but um, but the idea is that they're still non-zero at this temperature, and they um, and uh, and they're all basically relatively the same size, which is why you can sort of see them all equally well. Um, and you try to frustrate the system by putting a J two. Um, no, yeah, the movies, but actually the next movie is showing a geometrically frustrated system. Okay. So it's... I see, I see. Second movie. Yeah. We will go to that. That was a nice segue into the second movie. Um, actually, that appears to be the third movie. Um, oh. There's we have movie. downloaded three movies. Mangal, uh, Sorry, we are downloading the second movie. So okay, can we see the third sure, movie we first, actually. Um, that would be fine. So um, the third movie is just the low temperature Kagame, a chunk of the Kagame system. 
Oh, I see. Okay, let's see that. We will come back to second movie. Let's see. It's just you know, it's just two different temperatures. Um, you're basically the same thing. Different. So here, this is a beta of for the J equals one nearest neighbor Kagame Heisenberg model. Okay. And significant thermal fluctuations on the bonds because of um, see that the spins because this is at low temperature and you have fresh frustration as well. I see. Um, so the the weak bond denotes that basically there is no singlets are cross. Okay. That's right. So the S value higher on this. So it's really yeah. resonating singlets. Yes, that's right. So you see this actual resonating valence bond kind of physics mm -hmm. here happen. It's a, you know some kind of completely unbiased numerical method. Hmm. Still get kind of physics, which is nice. And this is the size of your system, actual. System. That's right. This is and has open boundary conditions. So you can see that the bonds around the outside always sort of remain strong because they don't have any neighbors. Um. If you look at the spin values, can you see some wandering spin-ons mm, in this, this picture? I just in that much detail. Because uh, I, I see some sites uh, so somewhere where every bond is weak. That means there may be an unpaired spin there. Oh right, okay. Mm -hmm. So, or you mean um, you mean you mean a whole a whole triangle that's weak, or just? Or you know, you, you take a given site. There are four bonds. Mm -hmm. So if all the four bonds are weak, oh, that means there is a moment hanging there. Right. Right. Unpaired moment. In a weekend. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, but of course, if you take the base to be too large. Um, the whole system is just going to be and its properties will be uniform. Uh -huh. Yes. So, though, you know, there might be sort of virtual spin-ons there, you can see them. Correct, correct. Exactly. That's what I mean. Virtual spin mm -hmm. So already, this is, a, this is a rather low temperature system. So, so maybe those are already kind of being suppressed. Mm -hmm. So what is this temperature? So this is a beta of 20, and this is with a J equals 1 for the, um, for the uh, spin half. Um, Kagame, so uh, beta is? The beta is 20? 20, OK. Hmm. But you know, as you know, the gap is a small system, as, as Steve has showed recently. So it may not be that far below the gap. Yeah, yeah. For, OK. Hmm. The, so the gap is very small here, right? It's supposed to be gapless for n period system. Um, sort of matter of debate. <laughs> but yes, uh, gapless or else very, very. Okay. So we will check for the second movie. Yeah. No, again. Yeah. Oh. oh, sorry. The second movie is getting downloaded very slowly. Sure. So the second movie is at higher temperature. That's right. Okay. So uh, no problem. It, it, it looks quite similar. similar. Uh, a greater fluctuation in the bonds, and then the spins are more. That's that's basically the different the other movie. I see. Well, what are the red lines? In some places, you show red lines. So, um, the red lines red are bond. just showing that the value of s dot s is actually positive on those. Oh, I see. Um, it's, it's negative on most of the blue bonds. It's, you know, okay, like ferromagnetic correlation. Okay. Fer yeah, ferromagnetic on those bonds. So, any questions from the audience? So the second movie is getting downloaded, but you are saying it's very similar. It's very similar. Yeah. Actually, yeah, these, some of these slides look like similar to the second movie. Those last few, just because like, you could see the spins more, vividly and you could see stronger fluctuations. And so, essentially, the second just has more rapid fluctuation, stronger fluctuations, and uh, and the spins are more readily because you had a higher temperature. Okay. So that that's all. Mm -hmm. So very thank you. Nice. So please proceed with your lecture. Is that the? Great. So that, that's almost like okay. I think a couple of slides just to thank to thank the organizers and um, to thank, thank uh, both White so Kiran support. So and uh, uh, well, that's all. I'm sure there will be questions from the audience now. So we will. Uh, we have about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the thermal. Uh, 
thing that you described, that's very exciting. It was a pleasant surprise to me. So, can you explain about this uh, square root of Boltzmann factor? Sure. Uh, so, uh, I'll go back to um, the slides that were showing the um, this rest making symbol, but with the with the chef. Yes. And uh, where that um, is derived, because um, I kind of quickly. Yeah. Um, so. Um, so where where should I should I? See, going forward now, the other direction? Yeah. So, yes. So this is, um, yeah. Now, you, yeah, you, there is, it would be nice if you repeat this in the next 10 minutes, quickly. Sure, so, um, so actually, if you forget. algorithm, yeah. I, I like this picture. This isn't a picture, actually, on the previous slide. Um, this, this one cartoon here. This isn't my picture, but this is actually from the um, Viewpoint article in this uh, Physics magazine online okay. that was a uh, Steve's um, um, 2009 article, okay. and this has a nice picture. Too. So you imagine at the at the very top of the figure you have these product states, yes. and then and you get this um, entangled state, yes. and the, each of those you kind of add to your thermal ensemble, and then you're always measuring them and returning back to this kind of cloud of uh, right. un, un, so that's a nice picture. Um, okay, so good. So um, on the next slide. So in this picture, mm -hmm. you have this big blue island. We say then you go to minimally entangle the typical thermal states. What does that mean? It might be a little confusing actually about the picture. So that that blue island is mm -hmm. just could be entanglement in the system. Right. Um, it's sort of representing entanglement in which you see it's localized to each spin up, and then it's um, across the system at the. Of course, it's not really long range, but but you know some kind of entanglement, and then I think. The my, but, but the arrow is just saying now include the state in the set of previous states that we've already produced. Um, so I, I don't think there's actually meant to be an operation there. It's just sort of saying that we logically okay. included the previous ones. Okay, let's yes. go to your, yeah. Uh, there is a question. Um, Shanai has a question for the previous. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, when you there's a step which says thermalize e to the minus beta h by 2. So that means that I just take the classical state and multiply the classical state, I mean operate this e to the minus beta h by 2 on the classical state once or do I do it many times? Once. Once, once. And right. then uh, when you're done you have one of these entangled states and then you have to collapse a classical state and then that operator again on the new classical state. Oh, I yes. see. And do e to the minus beta h by two on the on the collapse state again? Yes, but this time it would be a classical, probably. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good. So. Uh, so. That, and so we yeah, we apply this always classic. Um, and again, you know, the details can be. I should mention that um, I only the only type I showed this talk for doing this um, operator was to apply. These bond operators, but for Hamiltonian, you can also use a matrix product operator. So just as I showed earlier, you can make factorized types of operators. Um, you can do this for this uh, as well, and there's a lot of literature on how to make those. Um, unfortunately, it would you know take a lot of detail how to do it on this talk today. But you could make an operator for this e to the minus h over two actually. So this um, is the first time you introduce e to the power of minus beta h over two. Right. So you'd explain, uh, yeah. explain where the two comes from, actually. Uh, we got in a, a few slides later. So um, did, did you want me to explain about the two? Yes, please, yeah. OK, so then these are, these are steps. Um, so if you would advance just maybe three more slides. Um, OK, good. Uh, so uh, advance two more slides. Um, one more slide. Um, one more, please. Okay, good. So this, this uh -huh. so the have to factorize your full density matrix into two pieces, and so the factor of two is appearing. Um, and so the reason you do this is because you can insert this complete set of states, uh -huh. and these states eventually are these are that are going to be the product states, these odds. Um, and so hey, it's because now you get a nice symmetric factorization where once you think this operator onto the I, you 
Symmetric decomposition of your density matrix. That's the idea. So, um, is the audience uh, clear about it? No response from the audience. Okay. They are clear. Please good, go good. ahead. Good. So, the, it's this you take your um, density matrix and at sum of outer products of other operators, other states. That's actually called a um, decomposition of the density matrix. Uh -huh. So they, but to be a true decomposition, you have to normalize them. And so when you normalize them, the norms go underneath, and then you have to put the p in front, and so those, those weights. So you get one of these um, expanding your um, density matrix in a state. That's the idea. And the intermediate state that occurs here is all states. You are resolving unity. That's right, resolving unity. unity. And so when you do the actual operation, you pick up one product state, a typical product state. Um, I see. And then I just operate a to the minus beta h on that, collapse it. I will get a new state which is of the product state kind. I operate a to the minus beta h by 2 on that again. Correct. And keep doing this. And I, I simply take, the, for any, any expectation value of any operator, I simply take the sum average of right. the expectation values on all these states I have generated by this, um, something like a Markov chain that I have generated. Yes. Exactly. That's, that's, that's so, you know, that, so that was the question. The question was, uh, how, where did this beta h by 2 uh, come? So, so the beta h by 2, as I understand it, is simply taking, uh, so what you're doing is you're, you're, you want to sample a to the minus beta h, Correct. So what you're doing is you're taking the square root of beta h. Why? Uh, because you want to then go to these uh, classical states. Be uh, because then the idea is if you, int if you introduce yeah, a factor. That's what I want to, yeah, yeah. roughly see, but. Uh, right, so, so you, the idea is you actually, you want state. So, so if you don't do this factor as it, mm -hmm. you always work operator. But by doing this factor as factor, it allows you to put, put in a resolution of the and now you have the decomposition in terms of some kind of states. So, so it's not to be a sample over states rather than operator. That's why you need to put in this. I see. So it's each of, of these states, if you if you if you take the phi tilde states, phi i tilde states, yes. each of them are now weighted with weight one, if you like. Um, yes, right. right. So that's why that, so that's why we are able to then uh, just ge generate those states by just running. Uh, e to the minus beta h, classically collapsing it again and then running it and then therefore you'll be actually sampling that new kind of probability distribution which is uniform. So, le yeah, let me, uh, now, it's yes. like let me, suppose I work in microcanonical ensemble. Mm -hmm. That means my density matrix, my averaging will, will, in, will involve some or all uh, this brand ket mm -hmm. corresponding to the constant energy. Um, yes, right. So mm -hmm. that's what you are doing. So you, you you do you work in a canonical ensemble because of Boltzmann factor, but you rewrite it as if you are working in a micro canonical ensemble because the sum of phi i's will typically belong to the same energy. That's right. Yes. Am I understanding it correctly? That's a that's a very helpful perspective, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so if, like you said, it's it's not exactly the case. Because there will be fluctuations in the energy. Mm -hmm. So as you make beta to be larger, those will, or, or unless, unless generally for larger beta, away from transitions. Because you'll find you know, this taking square root is always uh, fascinating. Dirac did it, and he discovered antiparticles and so on. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I like that. Um, can, can, can I can I just uh, uh, reasonably clear? Um, and, um, so. Follow up on that previous question, um, to say that the, the weights of the phi tilde are weights are one here. But yes, the thing right. that you're really sampling with, um, the thing is that it's important to normalize them. When you norm, you're putting the norms underneath, and the p's appear on top. Now those are actually the weights. Um, but the thing oh. is, you never you those weights um, you you sample, and when you the part of the algorithm is automatically giving you the next state with the correct probability weight of p, this pi. So uh, that's why when you compute an average, you, you take an unweighted average because the um, probabilities were care of for you in this in sampling. Um, 
And so in principle, for instance, you could actually get the same mess twice or more than once. Uh, so the probabilities already are taken care of for you. Yes? So Shanai has a question. Uh, so I guess uh, 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 a sort of a different way to look at what Pascal is asking is, suppose instead of dividing it by 2, I, I make it as beta times alpha h, alpha is some number between 0 and 1, and beta times 1 minus alpha h on this side. Then uh, you don't have the advantage that the two, uh, you know, the states that uh, you get by acting e to the minus beta h, uh, the bras and kets are the same. You don't have that advantage. So two actually gives you the advantage that both these states turn out to be the same. Mm -hmm. So that's you, yeah. And so you can think of this outer product as like um, like an expectation value that's waiting, basically. Mm -hmm. So when you take the expectation value, it's similar to taking the trace. Uh, and the trace will take these out product facing outward and wrap them around, and now they'll be facing inward. <coughs> thing like an expectation value. So you decompose symmetrically like this. And so if you did this kind of metric one, you would have one state on the left, different state on the right when you do when you did the expectation value. And that's interesting to think about. I mean, there might be another vari variant of the algorithm that where it's actually advantageous to do that. But um, how you state is not really clear to me how, how, the, um, how you make the collapse part work the next state. But there, there are problems that might lead to some very nice um, new output. Mm -hmm. So uh, just uh, one comment. If you choose the intermediate state when you resolve unity, I as really uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, yes. then the separation into e to the power of minus, you can do it in any way you like. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, That's weird. Maybe that would be a good case to think about for to come up with a more general uh, version of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How uh, So, how exactly you do the operation? You explained it, I believe, but maybe you can repeat it. Sure, sure. How, how, how do you evaluate that? Yes, um, of e to the minus beta h over 2? Yes, exactly. Okay, so, so the example I showed um, occurs in just about three or four more slides from here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that example is um, just the example for a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. So, um, so again, you know, you can do this for more general Hamiltonians, and there you have to do it with make product operators so or I'm some other. I mean, going in the right direction, how do you? So this is a, this is so, um, so fast. I probably should have written a couple more lines, but um, the idea is let's think of a Hamiltonian where you can write the Hamiltonian as a sum mm -hmm. of operators. So a simple example, spin chain with nearest neighbor interactions. And so H1 would be S dot S connect from 1 to spin 2, H2 dot S3, and there'd be H3, S3, S4. Um, and so this is, I'm thinking of uh, with nearest neighbor interactions. And so take um, beta over 2, and you can chop it into even smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and so tap the, you know, some small number less than 1, you know, 0.1 or something. And um, the idea if you, is this way, you're making errors of order tau cubed. So you tau small enough, you have a controlled way to um, factorize this operator, e to the minus beta over 2, first into piece of size tau, and, and, and then you also can factorize it in space in this way. Um, only making small errors um, as shown. Um, so then once you have this, um, we call these gates, these, um, these e to the minus tau h sub each bond in, um, you take these gates and you apply them one time. And, and once you're done, that's like applying one, one amount of time step tau. And if you do, then once you're done with that, if you, if you go enough time steps, you apply the full e to the minus beta over 2. So applying one gate means apply the operator, and again, um, on this side, it sh you can see that that's a pretty small local operation. So this is just a 4 by 4 matrix, basically. And you're applying it onto sites, and that again, kind of small matrix um, with maybe dimension 4 by m. And you can do that using a nice code. You know, any, any code that you can work with these tensors um, conveniently, you can do this, um, you can apply this gate exactly. So there's no error at that point. Um, so once you apply the gate, it's sort of you can think of it as fusing these two tensors together, and you just get a single tensor now in that one bond. Um, so if you'd please advance, it'll show that single tensor. So that gate will kind of join the tensors together. But then, 
to, be, to bring it back into this standard um, form. And at that point, you have of moving where the, um, we call it the orthogonality center, but it's this location of these amplitudes. You can move it to a nearby site. And that you can ignore all the other sites because they're unitary. And you can just apply the gate locally near where these amplitudes are located. And then in this way, you, you move through the system in a sweeping-like pattern. It's actually very similar to doing um, real-time DMRG. You're just using a different kind of gate. Um, and so each time you SVD and you truncate also to control um, growth of your bond dimension. Okay. Hopefully that, that One more question. Yeah. How is it, can you, the mic could move. How is it different from uh, Xiang's algorithm uh, for uh, finite temperature DMRG that you had about a decade back? Oh, um, let's see. So, very familiar with these other methods, but was that method, am I right, that it had some idea of transfer matrices? Is that the method? Okay. Um, so I, I probably, you should take my comments with a grain of salt because I haven't recently looked at that method, but my belief is that that method works well, but it's sort of um, not maybe as wide. So you might, it might be that as you're limited, first of all, to one. Um, also, it might be harder to use it on more general kinds of Hamiltonians, um, like maybe actions and with uh, so, so yeah, really any, this is a very generic algorithm. You can use it um, in any kind of system where you can like make an, uh, make an MPO, for instance, for Hamiltonian, you can make this algorithm work as well. You can also make this Metz 2D. And um, finally, the scaling of Metz is quite similar to the scaling of ground state DMRG. And in fact, it can be much better in certain cases. Um, so I'm not sure what this uh, Zhang's um, algorithm is, but it would be interesting to compare this. Um, to Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, I should make a follow-up comment. So if you're from um, a paper that Steve wrote a few years um, before, that's he, they came up with a method together with Adrian Feigen, and this method is called the ENS method. Um, basically, you you the entire e to the minus beta h over 2 operator in one shot. And so um, if you're familiar with that method, METS is kind of like a descent of that method. But the Ansel method scaled to the 6 power, so it really doesn't scale very well. That scales as only m to the cube power. So really, METS is almost as, as well as you can do, because it's the same scaling as DMR itself. OK. So if uh, I think. There are no further questions, so we will think about you know, what you have told us today, and we will have discussions in the afternoon, and we will communicate with you through email. So it's really a great pleasure to thank you for uh, taking these extra efforts to come to the office and uh, <coughs> this late hour and enlightening us with these two nice talks. Thank you. Uh -huh. So well, thank it would have been much better if you were <coughs> with us. But uh, yeah. so in fact. Just to make you feel bad, today afternoon we are going to the beach. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, you, but we will talk about what you told us. Great, great. I uh, put this picture because the boats kind of reminded me of uh, fluctuations, all these nice colors of the boats that sort of, they sort of in my head somehow like this product state of these fluctuations. It's kind of a dorky, or nerdy joke. But, so, you know. <laughs> We will surely get you back. You know, there are so many interesting things going on at Mad Science, including something called the Quantum Science Center, where you have uh, young visitors spending few months with us. So uh, I'm sure you will come and s we'll sit on the boat and take a photograph also. So um, I'm sure I'm missing out on a lot of nice conversations. Um, right. It's all my friends, Bob and I uh, wish I could be there with everybody. So thank you very much. So we'll get back to you officially. Uh, with the cancellation charges and other things. Uh, oh, really... it came today, so yeah. so I did. <laughs> but yeah, so. okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. So uh, good night, and uh, so we will com uh, communicate with you.